Okay, so so I'll give you a little bit of context on what got me excited about bringing in Sean, even though this is actually our first time uh, uh, face to face. Um, so I, I feel like I, every time Sean publishes something new, my like Twitter ecosystem like serves it up to me, and it's always like the the thing I exactly want to be reading at that exact moment. Um, you wrote the other side is not dumb, right? Like that, like I think that was one of the first that I found, and like. I was like, man, this is so right on. This is like at just the moment I need to read this and hear this. Um, you wrote about localism more recently, about intellectual dark matter, um, a great one on like on what a career in content looks like. And and I, I feel like just a, a, a high hit rate when you when you put something out. Um, and so I got really curious. Uh, and and when when Stu said, hey, you know, you should. Uh, think of some some people to bring in. Sean was like really high on my list, even though we'd never met, and I thought it would be a a, a fun excuse to get to meet him. Um, and so, um, but I want to I want to also give Sean a chance to introduce himself because while I've while I've studied him online, that's probably not enough to to truly know a man. Uh, so so uh, <laughs> let me let me turn it over to you just to give like a like some brief context on some like, people know about your work history, but like. Some brief context on kind of your writing journey, um, and uh, both both kind of personally and professionally, um, just to sort of set the stage for our, our conversation. Thanks. I greatly appreciate all of those nice things you said. Um, the shortest way I can put it is growing up, if you asked me what I wanted to be, I would say write and get paid for it. And I thought that meant like a local newspaper. So I went to school for journalism at Temple University, and I graduated uh, in 2008, which was a terrible time to graduate college with a newspaper journalist degree. Um, newspapers were crumbling, the economy was crumbling. So uh, as a result, I uh, started a website with some friends called Technically Philly, which covers technology here in Philadelphia. And that was like a fun entrepreneurial thing. And ever since then, I've just kind of pivoted to all these different like online audience building, publication building uh, uh, roles. Uh, and where I find myself today is I'm the director of content at a place called Crossbeam, which is a startup uh, also here in Philadelphia. So like my obsession is building products for communities. So that's been designers, that's been computer programmers, that's been salespeople, that's been people in Philadelphia. Uh, I just really dig diving into and serving a group of people with a shared interest. And I'm gonna throw a curveball question out to start. I'm ready. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't write down in our, in our doc. Um, so, so content and writing and audience building is like definitely having a moment in 2020, 2021 um, for, for individuals and also for, for companies. Like it feels like kind of everyone, every single person is a media business, every company thinks they might be a media business. Um, why is this happening? Uh, is it a good thing? Um, and yeah, I guess that some of the, like the, the, I'd be curious for your hot takes on on why now <laughs> uh, um one of it's definitely tools um you know like we have our sub stacks our stripes uh setting up a blog is easier than ever setting up a newspaper or newspaper newsletter service is easier than ever and i remember thinking in like the 2010s like why is this so goddamn hard and now the fact that it's so easy is so great and you just see like this proliferation of all these like publications um so i think that's thing one uh, thing two is people are exposed to more like creators now, like the idea that you could be an individual writing about a topic independent from any institution, I think is relatively new in its popularity. Um, in the same way that if you talk to like your teenage nep nieces and nephews, they'll be like, I want to be an influencer. It's the thing they see, right? It's like the way they are, are learning about the world. Um, and I think the way a lot of us are learning about the world is independent writers. So I think there's that. And then from the company perspective, um, Anyone, if anyone here works in marketing, you know just how like precarious it is to like rely on like you chase like the Facebook soccer ball and then you go chase like the SEO soccer ball and then you go chase like the social media soccer ball and you just get like rerouted a bunch of times. And uh, I think the smart companies are just throwing their hands up and be like, I'm not dealing with any of this. I'm owning all my channels. I'm doing inbound only. I'm not, I'm not going to like burn all these calories and money doing outbound. And that's a long, hard slog, but it just has compounding benefits when the former strategy, it just takes like one change in like an algorithm or like a piece of tech or hardware to just totally like over like whelm and unearth your strategy. So I think that's the confluence of things that are happening right now. And then we, we can't, 
overlooked that most of us have been stuck inside for a year and a half straight and uh, are willing to be more, if you have white collar work, you're lucky enough to maintain your job. You probably have a little more cash on hand than normal. You have a little more spare time, maybe. Uh, and I think a lot of that's funneling into individual writers, which is, which is good for writers for, for sure. And um, to pick up on something you said, you've, you've argued um, that uh, writers should own their own platform. Um, and, and I'd love to hear your, your argument for why that's true today. Um, does that mean, uh, get off Substack? Uh, uh, does that mean, uh, zone ghost? Does that mean start your own blog? What, 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 what does that mean to you in, in 2021? Uh, it's about independence, right? Like to quit your job, right? Not rely on a boss and like start up your own, like publication and then only to then like rely and be the mercy of like some algorithm you're just like trading masters in a way. Um, and what I, I just witnessed enough cycles and maybe you know, people in this room have too, where everyone thinks something's a big deal. And then the platform, like right now, everyone's like, gotta get on clubhouse, like build your audience on clubhouse. But like, you don't own that relationship with your audience. They could just change something at any moment and it's like gone. Um, so the thing you should funnel your, your energy and time and money into is owning the relationship with your audience. And that normally honestly means like collecting their emails and emailing them directly and be independent of any intermediary. Um, and I think it's, it's important for ca career security. It takes longer to do that, but no one can take it from you. Um, and it's not only career security and that a platform can't take it from you, but, um, if you're a designer and you have a big audience who respects your design and you get fired or laid off from your design job, you can very easily then talk to hundreds of people who know you're a designer and say, I'm looking for a gig and probably land on your feet. Um, it's just like the best kind of insurance in an in information age. And every, like everyone should have like some tiny version of this, I feel. And, and by the way, um, if any of you have a question, just want to jump in, like feel free to, to jump in. Yeah, this, this should be uh, collaborative and, and, and especially if you uh, disagree with me. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like especially if you disagree with Sean. Um, so, okay. So if you're a talented writer and you, so a writer comes to you and they're like, I would like to make boatloads of money using my writing talent, um, over the next three decades. Mm -hmm. What, what, what's, what's your advice? I'm, 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 uh, I'm not optimizing for, for writing about things I'm passionate about. I'm not optimizing for, um, you know, it's just, I, I, I want to make, I want to make cash. <laughs> uh, so I think this was beautiful about this moment in time right now. And that like, that's more possible or accessible to people than ever before. Um, and the thing I would say is pick a tiny, tiny B2B niche or business niche or something where money is sloshing around in some way and own it. Um, I think we can see, we probably all subscribe to newsletters where people are covering, um, I don't know, like people cover like the pharma industry or like SaaS sales, or they pick some thing in which you can credibly write about, cover, unearth new information and own and charge people for it. I'm either charging directly for the newsletter or charge for consulting. Um, a, a, a structure I'm seeing now a lot of people do is have a free newsletter, get as wide of an audience as possible, and then become the guy or, or woman who's like known for that like tiny thing. And then people come to you and pay you for consulting. Uh, I know like lobbyists who do this. I know uh, like business analysts who do this. Uh, I know people who work in tech companies that do this on the side. Uh, I think that's the fastest route to cash. Um, and it could sometimes mean writing about what other people would perceive to be very boring things. But if you have like a spark of interest of, of something that other people think are boring, but uh, people will pay for it. I mean, that, that's the fastest route. Uh, you won't make it being like a general interest writer. You won't make it being like, it's just a content person, like doing SEO posts. Uh, you need to own a topic for sure. And, and if you're, let's say you're starting out in your career and you're thinking about um, how to invest your time and build build skill as a, as a content creator, um, but both so that, so that you would be employable by your dream company, but also be able to build an audience on your own. Um, what are like, how would you suggest like a, a young writer spend, spend their time to be able to set themselves up for, for the kind of career they want? Do you, do you want to hear my old man take? This is one of my oldest Please. man takes, which is, uh, everyone wants to be a creator, but no one wants to do the work. Like you, I, I, I think that uh, 
I view things, I think you have to view a filter for your writing. And I, my filter is like journalism, like the journalistic process to me is the fastest way to produce um, unique insights and learnings, which people would want to read. So um, a lot of people aren't willing to pick up a phone, aren't willing to like cold email people, aren't willing to email 30 people for like one piece of writing, uh, aren't willing to have their work. I mean, everyone in this room is, is willing to have their work edited. That's what this is about. But like the the act of not acting as if you're the subject matter expertise, even if you think you are, and going out into the world, whether physically or digitally, and extracting insights from people smarter than you is hard and it's tedious and it doesn't always work, but every time you do it, you will learn something. And that's the thing I would encourage a young writer to get good at is to just, um, the fact that people can be 22 or 23 and be like, I want to like build an audience around my expertise around something. I like kind of always bristle at that a little bit because you just need, you need time either talking to subject matter expertise or experts or being that or like living it through. Um, and that would be my advice is to talk to as many people who are smart and doing the, uh, in the industry or space, which you want to write about or cover. Great. Uh, Stu had a good question, a uh, random question. Does the Gmail algor algorithm in the promotions folder pose right. any meaningful right. threat to owning your own audience? I mean, the answer is yes, right? Like clearly, yes. Um, if everyone's using Gmail and Gmail decides all of a sudden that newsletters from a MailChimp IP address get put in the promotion tab, like that's, that is like, it's something I live in fear in because it's like the last frontier of uh, uh, the audience ownership. So like, to be clear, I've had people push back on me where they're like, well, like the hosting company, like your stuff's on a hosting company, like you're not owning that. And I know there's a level it gets down to where you just do have to trust these platforms. I guess what I'm saying is make that level as close to your chest as possible um, with the few amount of externalities. Uh, I, I, but I, yeah, I, I live in total terror that Gmail will do this. At least they, uh, I mean, actually, this is a good indicator about like why the like tech platforms are troublesome sometimes because like all it really would take is like one product manager at a meeting at Google to be like, you know what, newsletters are all going to this tab forever and ever, and it would just like screw like a lot of us, right? Um, so the more you can protect yourself from those decisions in other ways, I strongly recommend. Um, you've hired a lot of writers over your career. What's your process for recruiting and evaluating writers? My favorite thing to do is like lurk on people's blogs who they don't think anyone's reading them and like track uh, like their progress. Medium used to be good for this, less so these days. But like um, the obvious answer that you're gonna hear is like, right, right, right. But I would say show a curiosity in like a particular niche, right? Because if I'm gonna hire you, like Crossbeam, our, our target audience is people who work in partnerships at SaaS companies, right? That's like super narrow and weird. And I, you need to show me that you can get super narrow and weird about a topic and like love it and like cover it and think constructively about it and unearth new information about it. Um, that skill is very transferable to different niches. Um, to me, the thing I don't want to see is people, I think when a lot of people are like content writers, what they're really doing is taking a few keywords, putting it in Google, seeing the top 10 results, collecting the best of the top 10 results, adding a little something and calling it like content and like, that's it. Um, I don't want to read that. I don't want to write that. That sounds like a miserable way to live. Instead, like focus on like the humanity of it, which is uh, talking to actual people in that space and unearthing new insights in that space. And that's the thing I look for the most. Um, honestly, the writing could not even be could be like mediocre to poor. I don't care. Like I feel like we can we can work on writing, we can work on packaging, we can work on framing. I can't teach that like curiosity and that that doggedness to unearth new information. And that's the thing I look for. And it's, yep. I think it's served me well in the hiring I've done. Um, and it's the too many people think writing is about like prose, and it is if you're writing like a novel, I suppose. But like that's not what I think most of us are doing. What's, what's your advice for like, let's say, um, writers who feel like they're just constantly grinding on content, um, where, where like, you know, that, that, um, that maybe want to get some leverage in their career, right? Like that have a content calendar that feel like it's just, it's, it's owning them, whether it's, it's at work or whether it's, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some, some smiles, maybe, maybe some, some people are feeling that, um, 
uh, or or like just a personal content calendar that's that's taxing and tiring. <laughs> uh, well, there's like two parts of this. There's like building an audience is tedious and long, right? We can talk about that because uh, it is. Uh, or like the career aspect, and well, I think you more meant the career part. Um, and whenever someone introduces themselves or frames themselves as like a content creator or a content person, uh, I always like go, you're not, you're like capping your growth. And what I mean by that is like, content is an output and the people and the, and the spaces and the industries with the actual money to delve out to this, don't think to themselves, I want more content. They think I want to build an audience or I want people to come to my event or I want people to purchase this product or I want people to take away this thing, right? Um, and that's different. That's a different framing than creating content. So if you think that you are a content creator, ask yourself why, like go back to first principles. Like, what am I doing here? What am I trying to accomplish? Um, writing is just one way of executing, building an audience. Um, so I'm using the term build an audience as like, that's the core thing that I'm trying to do, but maybe you're trying to do something different, right? Maybe you're trying to like get in front of the right people. You're trying to host an event or you're trying to, you know, fund your travels around the world, whatever it is, but like content and writing is just the output. It's like you working in a restaurant and be like, I'm a Brussels sprouts maker. And it's like, well, no, you're like a chef. And like, not only you're a chef, like you are delivering like fun experiences to people looking for like a break from their day and to hang out with their friends. Like that's the business you're really in. You're not a Brussels sprouts maker. And I feel like that's what we're doing to ourselves when we say we create content. Stu, we should title this YouTube video. Don't be a Brussels sprout maker. <laughs> Second. I'm um, sure there's like a fancy, I've been watching a lot of Top Chef lately, and I know there's a lot of fancy names for things. I didn't know there were fancy names. I'm sure there's a fancy name for the Brussels sprout maker. A, a, a Brussels sprout, sprout tour, maybe. The vegetable monger. <laughs> vegetable monger, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mino had a question. Mino, why don't you just uh, come off mute and ask? Yeah, so following your curiosity or taking the time to email people or doing that sort of tedious work to find insight, it doesn't sound like that can happen on a weekly cadence, nor should it happen that way if you're really doing the work. And so I guess just piggybacking off of your last point, what is the point of a weekly newsletter that you show up every day, every week, if it doesn't have that level of curiosity and um, rigor? I mean, if you can't provide that weekly, it shouldn't be weekly. But I'll push back on the idea that you can't do it weekly. Um, this is why the journalistic approach to me is, is the key. Uh, there are reporters who are responsible for writing an article a day sometimes, two articles a week, three articles a week, where they have to go out and call a bunch of people and like literally go out, like track people down, and they do it, right? Um, because they view the hard part or the input is the reporting and the curiosity and the interviewing people, and then the output will come, right? And I think sometimes we get a little too focused on the output and not the input. The more uh, people that are in your circle, the more knowledge you have, the more people you can email, like, uh, like on a whim and like ask them questions, the easier the output will be. So start building that portfolio, that, that, that bullpen of people and anecdotes and resources and places you can go when you need to have the output. So it, it's definitely, it's hard. And it's especially, it's the hardest at the beginning, right? It's like getting into shape, right? Like the beginning is the hardest part. So, uh, of course it's hard and that's why no one does it. So if you do it, you will definitely stand out. And, and let's say you're, you're talking to a, a company that, um, that wants to build a more editorial voice. They want to, they're, they're saying, hey, we wanna build, go from, we've got a blog, we're kind of doing content marketing, but now we wanna be a media business. We mm -hmm. want editorial. Um, how, how, would, how would you advise that company? Like, like what, 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 are the, like, what, does it, what does it mean to become a media business or, or to have an editorial voice? Again, that's like an output without the, like what, why, right? I, I've had people uh, come to me and say, I did a brief like editorial, like consulting time in my life. And one time I remember like a water bottle company came to me and was like, we want to be, have an editorial. We want to have a blog. And I'm like, what if, what, like, what are people going to read? Like, we're going to do a hydration blog. Like, I, I don't understand. And I was like, this is not what you need. You need something else. I don't know what it is. So, I mean, that's thing one, not everything. Like when you're hammer, you can think everything looks like a nail. Um, but like, doesn't quite make sense. Um, so that being said, this is why like SaaS and tech are like leading the way here because it, it, it matches well with a media company, right? Like gather an audience and I will charge you a weekly, monthly subscription to our, our software product. 
And a bunch of people subscribe to, I don't know, pick your like Salesforce are a community. They're, they have a shared interest. They're trying to accomplish the same thing. And that's why Salesforce can like build a pseudo media company with a giant conference in San Francisco and tons of billboards and tons of like evangelists, like teaching Salesforce, right? Because they all have a shared interest uh, and they have a reason to connect to each other. That's not always true. So I would make sure that's true first. And then the second thing is um, make sure there's executive or CEO level buy-in of a certain opinion. Um, one thing I like about uh, working at Crossbeam is our opinion is that uh, like tech ecosystems will be the future of everything. Like APIs and partnerships and like loose con confederations of companies uh, will be the future of everything. And that's our opinion. And it's carried through in our product, our marketing and our content. Like to me, that makes sense. That's a, that makes sense as like a, uh, uh, something to build an editorial voice. Um, but I remember, do you guys remember, um, Casper mattresses made a magazine a while ago and it was like sleep advice. And like one, I don't want to have a recurring relationship with my mattress company. I want to buy a mattress company and mattress and never think about it again. Right. And then two, uh, I can't, as much as I sleep every day, I don't think anyone would be like, sleep's my hobby. I really want to stay up on sleep news, right? Like, so like, that's an example of like a, a, a mismatch. So you got to make sure those like, those base level strategy things are in, in, in line before you go. And, and, and if you, anyone here, a freelancer, you should ask yourself when people like are hiring you for articles, like think like, why are they doing this? Um, and I think people get caught in like bad content jobs is because they start out with this editorial aim and then they realize it's like hard and doesn't work. So then they just go into straight like turning, like let's just get all these keywords or let's like get fodder for social. And they don't, they like lose sight of the shore and then it becomes a grind, like, like the question you had before. Um, how would you, uh, so, so let, let's say, let's move that from, from a company to an individual, right? You're an individual and you want to build your own editorial voice. You, you, you may, you have, a, you have opinions on things, um, and, but like, you want to build something consistent that like, that, that brings people back to your blog, back to keep subscribing to your newsletter. But, but you you sort of feel like, Hey, my, my writing feels a little all, all over the map, but like, I want to develop this, this, what, what people call a voice, right? Mm -hmm. how, how do you develop a voice as a writer? And I, I, I realize editorial and voice are a little bit, a little bit yeah. different, but. But like, there's a. Uh... There's a, there's like a, some Hemingway quote, which I'm going to butcher, but essentially it's like, go live your life. Right. And like, that's where you get the experiences to write about. And I think, uh, that's like hard advice, but like you, one thing I, that when I talk to young writers and new writers is they're like, I don't have a voice. And the answer is like, they do, they're just, they have like a mental shield. They're too scared to like profess it. And part of it is giving someone permission to be like the best version of themselves or the most like extreme version of themselves. And, uh, this sounds uh, weird, but I find like through debate that usually happens. So it's like, well, give me your most controversial thing you can think of or a belief that no one shares on this topic. Why? And like dive in and explore that. And you realize someone is like a total cold rationalist and like can't deal with these romantics and their topic they're covering about. Or like they believe that I'm making this up. Cryptocurrency is totally the future. And like, that's something they really care about. Right. Um, or um like something I really believe in is like localism. And that's why I wrote that, that essay that you mentioned. Um, and like, the, so like, I believe it and the process is like, I float the balloon to see if anyone like shouts me down. Um, writing is thinking in public, right? So I'm like, this is how I think things should be. And then smarter people than you can say like, yes, no, or that's great and like elevate it. And like, that's how you start developing your voice by seeing what those like sparks in your chest end up actually like producing ideas and like written things. And the only way to do that it's just constantly like press and it's like a lot of friction and it's really hard, but you can't be scared. And I think a lot of people are scared. I hope that makes sense. It's like very, that's very like woo woo, but that's how it feels. I feel like when you're in the act of it. Love it. Um, and, and I'm, I'm curious also, how do, how do you like get the, the juice to write on your own when you're also writing at work? Like, I, I, and I feel like that's, that's a, a, a challenge that I think a lot of people in this community have where it's like, because because we're writers, you know, in our in our personal lives, there is we end up incorporating a lot of writing into our work, and then like that writing that you do in your work kind of slows you down when you're, you know, when you're in your your home life. And is it do you, do you use one to inspire the other? Like, um... I have a practical answer to that, an existential answer to that. The practical answer is uh, be forgiving for your with yourself. And one thing that I find 
good for any side project is I time box it. And if that's good if like you have kids or family where you have other responsibilities, you can just be like, I, from 10 to 12 on Saturday morning, like that's my side project time. And I'm not going to think about it outside of that time. I'm not going to feel guilty about it, but I'm always going to work in a, a 10 to 12. And it might not move as fast as you'd like it to move by doing that, but it will move. Right. And like, that feels good. And it gives you like mental permission not to be like Tuesday night after a long day and be like, oh man, I really should write. Oh, I feel so guilty. Oh, I'm so terrible. And then you don't. Right. And then like that creates a spiral. So I find that like time boxing, um, extremely important. It's the same way, like working out, right? Like if you don't make time and protect it, it's never going to happen. Um, I think, and that, that means sacrificing things. Like someone might be like, it's a beautiful day. You want to go to the baseball game? You're like, no, I'm ready. Um, that's thing one. And then thing two is my existential answer, which is, um, we're all going to uh, die someday. And one of the only things that's going to be left behind is our writing and our ideas and the things we leave behind. And that's the thing that I think about from some time to time. It's like, I have this way, you have this way, you're seeing the world right now and you want that captured in a time capsule for people who are going to live beyond you to read and appreciate. And like, I think, of, I think about that. It sounds really dramatic for like blog posts, but I think that is a good motivator. I love that. Um... So you, you have a good perspective on the levels of the editing process. I, I'd love to, if you could share that. Oh, oh, for, yeah. Um, so something when I teach like a junior editor, whoever, we're, so a, a lot of people um, think that editing is line editing, right? Like if you ask the average person like, hey, can you edit this? So like, what are the typos? Uh, where's the bad grammar? And like that stuff totally like does matter. I'm not begrudging it, but like that's the stuff you could fix. That's the beauty of the internet. I think that's a relic of like paper stuff where like it would be embarrassing if that got out there, but now on the internet, you're like, well, it's done. Um, and I like view inner the edits in like five levels and I I teach people one level at a time. Um, so I can like, I'll share, I can share a, 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 a doc afterwards or, or something, but like uh, it goes topic, outline, cohesion, framing, line editing. So the brief summary is topic, right? Is like the pitch. Uh, do people want to know about this topic? Does it have relevance to the audience? Like don't even get down to the exact outline, but like the big idea of the thing you're writing about, you're going to produce it and share it with someone. Do they care as best you can tell? Um, and if not, can you find the right audience for it? Uh, so a lot of that's at the pitch level. Uh, so I, I see some publications where they're just like, anyone pitches this anything vaguely related, I will say yes, and I will just go, go. Um, I think maybe as writers, you guys are frustrated, like you go to work for a publication and they're like, yeah, write a guest thing for us. And you're like, great, you write it. And you're like, I hope they like it. And they give you no edits. They're like, this is great. And then they just publish it. And you're like, sure, that didn't make me better, right? Like the, the topic thing is like, is, is the first step in mitigating that, I think. And then next is the outline. So, okay, you have the topic. Um, does the writer have something to say? And some people write things and they don't actually have anything to say. And maybe you've come across that when you're writing things, you get like halfway done, you're like, I don't even care about this. Um, and if the writer's bored, the reader's gonna be bored. So I make sure the writer has something to say and then um, are there enough evidence, examples, and insights? So we have enough poorly sourced stuff out there. We have enough takes with no real logic. Um, press on the writer a little bit and like challenge them, you know, like, well, like are millennials really worse off? Like prove it to me, right? Like things like that. Um, and then the next level cohesion, do the arguments hang together or are they just a bunch of like poorly like tied together with duct tape things they're linking to or interviews they've done. Um, you see this in like actual media and journalism where you can tell the person did like four interviews and was like searching for a way to like tie it together and produce an article. Um, something I would try to avoid as much as possible. Um, so that, those are like the big ones, like topic, outline, cohesion, like all that needs to be true before we even think about the words. Um, once that's like locked in, then I do um, framing. So like, what is the headline and how does that jive with the intro? And then how are we gonna distribute this, right? So the what is the most enticing part of this essay or article? Um, so maybe it's like, I actually just edited a case study for my job. And one of the big things, this person tripled revenue. Like that's the hook, right? So the headline should say that. The headline should support that, right? If uh, I always pretend um, I do this thing called the Starbucks test. Like if I just scroll through this in line at Starbucks, like can I get the vibe of what this is about? And like maybe even bookmark it to read later. Um, I want that to be like extremely evident. Uh, and then only then, then and only then do I go, are there grammar mistakes? Because everything else, the hard stuff's done. The topic's good. The arguments are sound. They're sourced. Uh, it's an appealing thing to read. Now I'll worry about the line edits. So 
I've had writers go like, Hey man, like you didn't get any of these typos. You're like such a terrible editor. And I'll just be like, I know I'll get to that. Like, let's like work through it. Um, it's like, if you were building a house and like before you had the foundation, you're like, I need to know the color of the drapes. And you're like, how big is the house? How many rooms is it? Where is it located? Um, so that's the like rough order. I try to do things. So topic outline, cohesion, framing, line editing. That's super helpful. Um, I also actually, you, you, you mentioned a couple of times that the journalistic process and like that's thing that I think probably a lot of people have like sort of in their head what that journalistic process is. But like when it comes to like how you would actually use it um, within your own writing outside of a journalism, you know, uh, 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 environment, like what, what, what's, how would you describe that process? Uh, the, the straightest way I can say it is that, come correct, which is if you're going to say a thing is true, back it up. Uh, there's like a journalism aphorism, which is um, if your mother says she loves you, check it out anyway, right? Like check every fact, check every source, uh, check every like thing you were, like opinion you were spouting uh, and make sure it's grounded in some sort of reality or fact. Um, you're making an argument. You're like a lawyer in many ways when you write something and it needs to be just like overwhelmingly true. Um, and the journalistic process is going out in the world, seeing what the world reflects back to you and summarizing it for the reader. Um, there's like variations of that, but like you need to make sure that what you're actually describing about the world is accurately reflected. And a lot of what we're seeing when people are trying to build audiences and brands, um, they're, they're writing what is like the compelling story, but not what's actually true. And this is when you get this like disconnect, I think in like society at large where people think a certain narrative is happening and it's just like absolutely is not. Um, it's because people aren't doing this like journalistic process of actually checking things, including journalists sometimes, frankly. But uh, that's the that that's the that's the 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 best I can describe it. If that hopefully is helpful. And, and when when you like think about like a a white paper, a blog post, or whatever, yeah, right? Like, like, yeah. like when, when you, yeah, you know, can be uh, a you dude, you're doing like content for a startup. Like, what's the journalistic process? <laughs> like no, kind no, of a, no, 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 no. Yeah. I, I, I think I, I, I like that, and I, I think it's, it makes a lot of sense. The, the, the question I always have is like, you know, do you, do you sort of write like when, when you're, when you're writing um, a piece, right, yeah. or when you're working on a piece, like, there's so much content in the world, right, and, and like, and, and so like, you know, to some degree, it's, it's sort of like the design and the, and the headline and the, the intro paragraph, like you can really just optimize for those and you probably hit, you know, 90% of your readers. And then mm -hmm. like, you know, the, the last 80% of the piece, you kind of phone it in, right? Like, and, mm -hmm. and you, you put a, a bunch of work, you know, at, in the, in the front to make sure that like the social, you know, image is super enticing and all these things hit. Um, but then every now and then, right? Like, like it's, it's the, it's what's buried into the, the, um, the the late parts of the piece that actually you know either get you in trouble or, or get someone mm -hmm. excited right there are obviously these readers that like voraciously consume the whole thing that save it in their inbox that read it over and over again like mm -hmm. who, who do you write for do you write for the person who's going to read the whole thing or do you write for the the you know majority of people who are going to kind of skim it you should always write for the most engaged people because that's what you're trying to build are right? you trying to build an engaged audience you're not trying to build an audience of skimmers you should accommodate the skimmers by making things easy to skim but uh, I have this like editorial test, uh, which I call um, the asshole read. And I just think, think of the person in your head who's like the biggest jerk to you who wants you to fail. And then picture they're reading the thing you've written and they're just nitpicking it, right? They're being like, this doesn't make sense. Who says who? Uh, this doesn't even hang together. Um, you like, I, I like write with that person in my head because like that person is your audience, right? Like is the internet. Like if you are lazy, People will notice. And the worst part about the internet is uh, people think the internet's like a mean place. Um, I actually think it's like a cold place. And that if you are bad at something, people just ignore you, right? And like, that's the worst where you don't even know you're doing a bad job um, because like no one's telling you, no one's challenging you. You're not even worth the confrontation, right? Um, that's what I try to avoid by like building an audience of people who like take the work we're doing seriously and want it to be good and will challenge us and um, have like really complex interests and needs that hopefully we are trying to meet with the things we are producing. Um, so I write for that person. Um, and that sometimes means writing that's harder to do. And we produce less stuff, I think, than most people for like a team our size. Um, but the good thing about a lot of like content is it's evergreen, right? 
Um, you're not covering the news, right? No one here is a news reporter, I don't think. So like quality stacked on quality, stacked on quality, stacked on quality, like just adds up over time to this like unimpeachable moat you will have in whatever you do. And it's just, it's just hard. It's just hard work. Um, Stu had the question, um, any advice on how to find interesting ideas to write about? Uh, and it depends on your niche, right? Uh, it depends on the, your, your goal, but um, the, the pre-pandemic answer would be like, leave your house, right? Like go talk to people, like go experience the world. Uh, this sounds like old man, like stuff, but like, I think ever, anyone, your competition for whatever you're doing is going to be doing what you start, right? They're going to be sitting at the computer, like reading blog posts, like watching YouTube, like getting those easily accessible things and like writing about them. Like that's the floor of building an audience. And a lot of people never like get off the floor, like to go in person, to call people, to challenge them, to pull original research, to um, do that. Like I said, journalistic process, that hard work, like that's how you like get that separation. And that the more people you talk to, it should beget more stuff. Like a thing I see all the time is like, oh, I talked to four people and there's this undercurrent of frustration with I don't know, interest rates and the way they're being managed. Like, cool, that's a piece I can write. Um, you start to like pull together threads the more you talk to people. So like whenever I hire a new writer, they always, I always go pitch me and they go, I don't know, I just got here. And I'm like, guess you got to talk to people. And sometimes I'll even give them a list. I'm like, talk to these 10 people and just ask them about their, their job. Ask them, um, like one question I always ask people is, what do you wish people would talk about in your space that they don't? Or not enough, what, what do you, would you say not enough people are talking about? Uh, and a lot of times people will give the same answer and that's like a piece you should write. Um, or... Um, what are you tired of hearing about and why, uh, tell me about a success you've had, or, you know, like just as open-ended questions to a lot of people who care about the same thing, we'll just, you'll get so many, many topics you can't even begin to touch. Um, our like blog posts, like to hit list at Crossbeam right now is like longer than I could, all of us could write one post a, a week for the rest of the year. And I think we would probably maybe get to it. Um, and it just comes from just talking to a certain community and this is why i think owning a niche is important versus being like a roamer because you can get like that depth and that complexity which sets you apart okay i'm going to turn this question back on you uh in the in the world of content and writing what are people not talking about right now that they should be talking about yeah, um i don't know if this is obvious you tell me if this is obvious um I hate the way we talk about like SEO and that SEO equals content. And I think it's poison. And I think it's poison an entire generation of people who would otherwise be fabulous writers that their first entry into the space is to like write for a bunch of robots that are going to change their mind in any second. And it's, it's, it's almost like Plato's cave. Like they're staring at the cave of SEO when they could just go outside and there's like a whole other world out there. And I, it's not only a disservice to like the internet and that we all get a bunch of like shitty seo fodder anytime we want anything but it's a disservice like human beings who want to write for a living that have to like toil uh serving people who erroneously think this is the way to go um i think it's like incredibly egregious and like almost like scandalous in the way people are uh running marketing and content organizations that way do you do you um like with with either your own stuff or with crossbeam stuff like um, how much regard do you give to SEO? Um, uh, like, is there, is there sort of like a, a lightweight way to like yeah, you know, yeah, automatically like, think of SEO no, without a, having to think It's a channel. About like it's a channel and especially it's a channel for um, beginners, right? People who don't know a lot about your space or whatever you're writing about. Like you absolutely should write like posts for that audience. Um, like we, like I said, I write in this like wonky space. So we do, do a lot of like, what are partnerships? Like, what is co-marketing? Because like, I want to educate people who are like literally Google and that, like maybe they got hired at a partnership job and they don't quite know what's what. Um, I want them to find us. And then like, I want them to then like ladder up into our more complicated and, and, and deeper insights for sure. But we got to like meet people where they are. And some people are at the point of just like literally Googling, Googling something. But you should have a plan for the people like that get beyond that. And otherwise you're just like writing for that like low interest, low information reader, which you, the, the fun part is turning that person into the super dedicated reader. Um, and just people are just like totally ignoring that. And that also that's the fun part. That's the fun part of the job is shepherding people along that journey. And we're like, not like people just aren't even doing that. 
Um, and I want to caveat this with like, if you like just are like an e-commerce store, like obviously SEO is king. Like it's literally a transaction. You're not trying to build a community, right? You're just trying to sell a muffler. Like I get that. I have an appreciation for that. But for people that are trying to build communities or, or careers as writers, um, that's, it's, it's like, it's a lot of dead ends or if it's not a lot of dead ends, it's, um, it's not an easy money, but not a lot of money. Does that make sense? Like you can easily make money, but like your, your limit is, I think you have a hard ceiling of, of your growth. Uh, all with the exception of like, we all know there's like a few like SEO experts who make like millions of dollars and like good for them, but like, it just sounds miserable and there's not a lot of them. What, what about for like personal content? Like, like is, is there a way where like, let's say, you know, you're, you're writing on your, your, your own website, right? You tend to write pretty deep, interesting stuff. Do you, do you, um, like what regard do you give to SEO and best practices when you're writing? Is it, is it, is it zero, zero or is it like zero? It's zero because it's like, I want actual people to read. I want people, I want people to find this interesting. Right. And I think a balance is, uh, some pieces that I get the most, like people emailing me about were only, only read, like call it like less than 5,000 times, which like, isn't nothing, but it's not like a runaway hit. You know what I mean? But like, it resonates with the, the, the ratio of people it resonates with is high. And that's what's fulfilling to me is like, okay, 400 people read this piece and I got like 10 emails about it. Like, that's awesome. I will take that 10 times out of 10 over like the, the I'll take the depth over the width, especially when it comes to like a personal brand. Like, like you and I are talking right now because like we identified with each other's like stance on writing. And like, that means more like if you were to like 10 X our audiences and no one were to talk to us, right? Um, I'll take that every time, especially for personal, uh, you can push back on me on like on a business sense that doesn't make sense. Fine. But on the personal level, like that's the fun part of the internet. You can find your people. So find your people. Don't write for not people. Don't write for not people. No, they're good for not people. That's expert advice. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, let's, uh, and, and, and by the way, if people have questions, uh, throw them in there. I'm, I'm, I'm not actually reserving. Well, I just saw this. I saw the chat. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not reserving a section for questions, so just throw them in there, and, and we can we can get you in there. Um, uh, let's pivot to audience building um, and and how you like uh, the the kind of with in, in two ways. One is like the mark the like content marketing piece of audience building. Let, let's talk about for for individuals. Like, um, how do you think about? Uh, the, the content marketing part of audience building? And then how do you think of the like affinity towards Sean building of audience building? So the, the business one and the, the personal one, right? Oh, uh, so sorry, I'm, I'm thinking um, like for, for, you know, for you personally, right? Like you, you personally sort of, you built an audience um, by mostly through, your, through the content you create, right? And so one of those ways is sort of like, your marketing, your content, and making sure that it, like it gets uh, out there. And yeah. then the second one is like, you know, you tweet stuff, you um, you you share things, and like uh, you do events like this, and people get to know you, and they get to see, and they get to they want to engage with you more. Um, how do you think about those things, or 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 do you think about it that way? I don't, because it like should be it should be fun, right? Like I just I try to like, what's the most fun thing to do? Like this is fun, this is fun, right? Like we're yep, talking about yeah, right, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think, I think the way to think about it, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to be like Pollyanna about it. Like, well, you know, you just get out of bed and start writing and it just happens. Like it doesn't, but like, um, I think when you write about things you are interested in, in a way that's unique, uh, you'll, you'll do it like 10 times and no one will read it, but all it takes is like the one person to like, give you that escape velocity, right? Like maybe someone discovering via Twitter or uh, someone putting in an email newsletter. And the later you get in your career, like writing consistently, the more like note network nodes you get, right? From people who like pay attention to you. Um, so like now, like I'm in an advantageous position where I think there's like 3000 people subscribe to my personal newsletter, which like, isn't like a crazy number, but it's enough that if something's like compelling, it'll like escape, right? Like people will tweet it and like talk about it. Um, and when you start, you don't have enough nodes, right? So um, it's hard and it takes a lot of time. And this is another reason why like the journalistic process is good because at the very minimum, everyone you talk to will like want to share it, right? Like it's like built in distribution. Um, and, and so like, you learn something, you get maybe an audience, like a fan or someone who at least is following your work. Um, you get another distribution channel. Uh, like to me, it's like a very virtuous cycle. Um, 
So that's why like having a curiosity about a topic is key because you need to be, that needs to be fun to you, for you to do. Um, and if it's not fun, you should find another, you should find another topic and like, be like really honest with yourself. Like uh, I have a friend who writes about like, I don't know, he's like really into like magic to gather and tournament strategy. <laughs> like that's what he writes about. He like does great. And it's like something like I could care less about it would bore me to tears, but like he loves it. And there's like an audience of people who love it. Um, I'm sure we've been in deep YouTube where people are like opening up, I don't know, micro fancy microphones and like talking about it. And like, it gets like a thousand, like thousands of views. Just like find the thing that you like can't not talk about. And I think that's, uh, that's the key to like stay on it um, and, and keep it fun. So, so as so you you got this you got this personal writing that you do and and you you built a following around it like what keeps you from going all in on being a creator or or like or like going going in it for yourself creating courses like like what whatever you 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 could do with this right like um what keeps you going to a day job um uh, I know you, you recently had a baby, so that could be one of those things. Uh, <laughs> it certainly keeps me going to my day job. Um, but, uh, but just, just, just curious. Uh, I like, I personally enjoy writing about, I don't want to be locked into a certain topic for that. That the, the, I know the discipline it requires, right? The people who really have successful newsletters or creators we're thinking about, they probably have like done this for like seven, eight years, right? That's like a long time. Uh, a job I had as I wrote for, um, I was the editor in chief for Vermeet Safety, and he has this uh, site called I Will Teach You Be Rich. It's a personal finance website. And he also had this sister site that we helped launch called Growth Lab. And Growth Lab was covering the creative economy like before it was called the creative economy. It was like people who launch courses and build audiences. And I talked to so many people who did that. And one of the trends I noticed is like after like three or four years, they're like, I've said everything I have to say, but sometimes I feel compelled to keep talking about it. Um, and that always stuck with me as like a... Uh, uh, a possible like dead end you should should i pursue that so i just like the range of being like i'm going to write about the philadelphia 76ers today i'm going to write about localism tomorrow i'm going to write about content the next day and then i'm going to write about you know whatever strikes my interest after that um it's not profitable but it's fun again like it should be fun have fun um for for those people who like maybe feel like they want to insert more fun into <laughs> their writing like like I'm sure you've probably gone through moments where like writing doesn't feel fun. Like, how do you get that excitement back? How do you get the, the joy back? Uh, I can only speak personally because I think it's different for everybody. But for me, the enjoyment of like writing comes from people, like talking to people, having people write, read it, having people react to it. And whenever I feel stuck, I realize it's because I've gotten away from the people side a little bit. So I'll either like go like interview people for my, for my uh for whatever i'm writing or like i will attend an event like a conference where i only have like a limited understanding of it but i'll just like go to like mix up my like again like nodes you know and like see, yep. see if that exposes anything else or um one thing uh oh i hope you guys have friends that you can like text articles to and like comment and like respond to and like go back and forth like that's a good like way of like re regenerating um one thing I've done is one of my side projects is this thing called Pilcrow House, where we host like dinner parties and like hosting dinner parties and having people like talk about the thing they care about. Um, I also find super like rewarding. So through people is that answer for me. But for some people, it's like, I need solitude, right? Like just everyone leave me the hell alone for like a few hours and like it will come back to me. Or, uh, you know, some people just need velocity. Like I just need to like start producing stuff. And even if it's imperfect, like I just need to like unstick it. Um, I think everyone has a different version of that. Um, I'm going to ask you a, a, a question that is very self-serving uh, because we're both in a similar life stage is what, when you have a, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make it a little broader. When you have a large new distraction in your life, maybe let's say a baby or something, uh, how do you, uh, how, how do you keep, how do you keep your writing habit up with, uh, with, um, with, with, with a mouth to feed at home? It's the time carve out thing. It's like, like everyone understands that these are my 90 minutes or two hours to like write this thing. Um, but I think we're kidding ourselves if your like output slows down in the short term, like it hundred percent does. And like, shouldn't feel guilty for, <laughs> for that. Um, but I, I think that the carve out thing, um, my child is three months old. I haven't written anything personally since then. And that's okay. Like I'd rather be caring about my child, but I will return to carving out that time again when it's appropriate. Um, and I hope everyone would do the same. Awesome. Um, Stu, do you want to jump in and ask a question?
Yes, I think these are related, but uh, you can tell me, Sean. So one was, um, how do you, what advice maybe would you get for getting people to feel more comfortable promoting their work and kind of like promoting themselves for lack of a, a better word? Uh, it's a great question because I feel this all the time. And I, what I try to reframe it as is like, I'm not promoting myself, I'm promoting the idea that I'm advocating for uh, or that I'm arguing or, or writing about, right? So it's like, I, I'm not saying pay attention to me. I'm saying, I would love you to look at this piece on localism I wrote and like, tell me what you think, right? Or uh, I wrote this piece about like um, NFTs for writers. Like, is that even a possible thing? And I wrote that because it's like, I didn't see it out in the world. And I wanted to like, see what people thought about it. So I had no problem tweeting it like 9,000 times and just being like, I wrote this, I wrote this. Cause like, I want the feedback. Um, it's a, it's the through people thing. Right. Uh, also like I'm a millennial. I want feedback. Like give it to me. So that's, that's the way I, that's the way I view it is it's about the P the work and not my like body of work. Does that make sense? Um, and I think people can get in their own heads a little bit when they get a little bit of an audience, they're like, Oh, I must keep like the image of me up and it's like the audience like cares about you but they really care about what you do for them and like keep the focus on that I even gen that. x guess... is one feedback <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i um my second part may i maybe it's related but like i guess um sometimes uh, you know i feel this tension between like shorter term growth uh yeah. mechanisms you know being spicing things up on twitter and taking a hotter take than you might actually have exaggerating or indulging your own expertise on a topic, which I think happens to an egregious degree on Twitter. And I'm confident I've been guilty of it. Um, how do you kind of balance that with like the long-term kind of integrity of, or, or maybe just how do you generally not fall prey to burning your reputation or being too short-sighted with, with growth? This, uh, the, t the tweets by definition, right? Like just like slide out of the feed and then you don't see them anymore, right? So think about like the logic of that. Like you dedicating a ton of time to producing a thing that is gonna be gone in like an hour, right? Or like 12 hours um, versus if you write something compelling and thoughtful uh, with a URL or an email that sits in people's inbox, like that's like permanent and evergreen. And like, I think that should scare you straight for the balance. You're like, uh, when I look back at the last month, uh, everything I wrote is just like ephemeral gone on the gone. And uh, the stuff that really matters uh, is I haven't, like I've neglected. Uh, that's not to say uh, I'm not a never tweet person. I find tweeting uh, awesome. Uh, and also for like laundering and like testing writing things, like um, that NFT for writers thing, I actually tweeted first, like, why is there no NFT thing for writers? And like enough people were like, yeah. Or like, did you look at this? Like I, I got enough like, just a tiny like spark where I was like, this is worth exploring. Um, so again, it's not in service to you. It's in service to the idea you're trying to work on. I think when you switch it like that, it can be a little, and it also makes you more interesting to like follow, I think, than if you're just telling people about your latest thing without a lot of thought to the idea that you're trying to share. Love it. Right. I mean, uh, any last questions? Okay, my last question for you, Sean, is uh, uh, you've given us lots of insights and, uh, and, and you've, you've taught us about your, your editing, uh, your, your pyramid of editing, uh, how, the, how you employ the journalist, journalistic process. Um, we've talked about uh, how you hire writers um, and, and a whole lot more. Um, what can this group do to say thanks? Where can we follow you? What can we tweet out and support? What can we? Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, the thing, uh, this is my self promo, uh, just described as my personal newsletter. I send it every three months, four months. And like, that's the stuff that I care about the most. Uh, and I would greatly appreciate it. SeanBlanda.com. Uh, there's a subscribe thing in the in the top. And honestly, the thing you can do is like write interesting things for everyone to read, including myself. Like that's the thing. We need more of that. Um, and I love this group and its mission because it's going back to the craft and going back to the people and go back to the collaboration. And like, that's where we need to go. And uh, kudos to all you who participate in this for that reason. Awesome. All right. Well, Sean, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and and uh, audience, thank you all. This was a blast. Um, and uh, happy Friday. Go enjoy the weekend. Yeah. Happy weekend, everyone. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Nick.